Welcome to the Beaverton Church online platform. Uh, I've just got to say, I miss seeing everyone so much. Uh, I'm so glad that you've decided to join us today on this venue. Uh, if you are still wearing your pajamas, raise your hand. <laughs> if you are watching this while you're drinking your morning coffee, raise your hand. If you don't drink coffee, raise your hand. That's me. I, I do not drink this stuff. Um, if you are already sick of this quarantine, raise your hand. No more social distancing, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. I like what you just did. If you did it, uh, did you participate? Uh, are you with us this morning? Were you raising your hand? Were you getting excited? You know, that's what I want you to do. I want you to participate. When we sing you sing. When we ask questions, you give answers. Uh, this video is to, uh, designed to be watched with others and to participate. Now, sure, you can watch it by yourself, but it'll be so much more fun in community, no matter how small that community is. What I want everyone to do right now is to check in on Facebook. Uh, I had several people ask me, how they can get their tithe to the church. There are several ways. One, you can mail a check to 540 Lang Road, uh, Beaverton, Michigan, 48612, and uh, that'll get to us. Um, I know there's some people that don't even use checks anymore. Uh, we're trying to get a little bit more high tech at the church. We are now using the Cash App, the second way. Uh, that you can send your tithe to the church is through the Cash App. Uh, the Cash App will transfer money from your bank to the church's bank account using your debit card. And if you'd like more details on how to use the Cash App, please send me a private message and I will respond back to you. Uh, you can message me uh, uh, through text or through Facebook. Also, uh, most banks allow you to set up a uh, pay bill online or a bill pay and uh, your bank will mail a check to the church. Uh, this is often a, a free service for uh, most banks, so hopefully yours will be as well. Well, in just a few minutes, we are going to begin our service. And I want to encourage you that before we begin, that you get your Bible or your Bible app and read the 23rd Psalms. The, uh, the way to get to the Psalms is to take your Bible and open it right to the middle. You should be real close to the Psalms, if not right there. Uh, it's going to be okay to pause this video as you get your Bible. Uh, we are going to worship today as a church, and I will see you in a few minutes. Now, uh, the reader of the Psalms will be the person in your house whose birthday is coming next. <laughs> All right, the next person to have a birthday, the next birthday, who is that person? That is the reader who is right now going to pause this video and read the 23rd Psalm in my house. That will be Gabe because his birthday is in April. All right, let's pause this and we will read the 23rd Psalm.
All right, thank you. Um, I, I would like to just say that, uh, you know, our praise team, they're trying to make the best of a bad situation. Um, you, you know, certainly uh, it's not anybody's intent to uh, make light of the virus or, or what, is, what is happening here, but, uh, you know, everybody's just trying to do their very best, and I know many of you are as well, and uh, many of you come today uh, with your own trials, your, your own troubles, your own uh, difficulty, and uh, I want to take a moment to uh, pray for you and, and to pray with you. And uh, we'd just like to ask that you would bow your heads uh, as we prepare to look at this 23rd Psalm. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we just ask that you would be with each and every one uh, that is here today. Uh, Lord, that uh, we're, we're not able to be in your, in your house and in this sanctuary, but Lord, we're able to be in your other houses. Uh, for Lord, we know that everything that we have belongs to the Lord. It is the Lord's doing that has given us our bed and, and given us a place to lay our head at night. And so, Lord, I pray that you would go, your Holy Spirit would go even right now and speak to the hearts of your people. Lord, may this message touch them in a very real and special way. And Lord, may your word uh, be broadcast out through all the earth and we just pray this in your name amen amen you know it's my understanding that there are uh literally thousands and maybe even hundreds of thousands of churches uh that are meeting the same way or a similar way uh, that we are today and so we just want to be in prayer for them and and uh you know in these times the difficult times as as uh, we move forward uh, to promote the gospel message in the name of, of Jesus Christ. Well, did you read the 23rd Psalm? I, I certainly uh, hope that you did. Uh, like many others, this beloved Psalm bears the simple title, A Psalm of David. Now, this Psalm was written by David probably when he was a king. Uh, he had been a shepherd, but uh, you know, he was not ashamed of his former occupation. Millions of people around the world have memorized this psalm, and even those who have learned very few other scripture portions. You know, most people, they get John 3, 16 and the 23rd Psalm, and then it starts to slow down after that. Ministers such as myself and, and others have used this to comfort people who are going through severe trials and, and uh, personal suffering or illness or, or dying, you know, and, and for some, these words of, of this psalm have been the last that they've ever uttered in this life. The scripture says in the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want David uh, thought about God, the God of, of Israel, and as he thought about his relationship with God, he made the analogy of a shepherd and a sheep. God was like a shepherd to David, and David was like a sheep. In one sense, this was not very unusual, for there are other references to this analogy between the deity and his followers in ancient Middle Eastern cultures. It is also a familiar idea throughout the Bible. The Lord is a shepherd to his people. This idea began as early as the book of Genesis when Moses called the Lord the shepherd, the stone of Israel in Genesis uh, 49 verse 24 in Psalms 28 9 David invited the Lord uh, to shepherd the people of Israel and to bear them up forever in Psalms 80 chapter 1 also looks to the Lord as the shepherd of Israel who would lead Joseph like a flock Ecclesiastics uh, 12 11 speaks of the words of the wise which are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. Also in the book of Isaiah, uh, chapter 40, verse 11, tells us that the Lord will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arms. 
in Micah 7.14 invites the Lord to shepherd your people with your staff as in the days of old. Also in Zechariah uh, chapter 13 verse 7, Matthew chapter 26 verse 31, John chapter 10 verse 11, uh, Jesus clearly spoke of himself as a good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep and who can say, I know my sheep. And I am known by my own. The idea of, of, of Jesus as the good shepherd was very precious to the early Christians. Now, it's remarkable that the Lord would call himself our shepherd. You know, Israel, as in other societies, a shepherd's work was considered the lowest of all work. And if a family needed a shepherd, it was always the youngest son, like David, who got the unpleasant assignment. And God has chosen to be our shepherd. The great God of the universe has stooped to take such care of you and me. And David knew that this metaphor in a unique way, uh, having been a shepherd himself, David used the most comprehensive and, and intimate metaphor yet to be encountered in the book of Psalms, uh, preferring usually to the more distant king or, or deliverer or the impersonal uh, uh, rock, um, shield, etc., whereas the shepherd lives with his flock and is everything to it. The shepherd guides. The shepherd is the physician. The shepherd is the protector. David says, the Lord is my shepherd. David knew this in a personal sense. He could say, my shepherd. It wasn't just that the Lord was a shepherd for others in a theoretical sense. He was a real personal shepherd for David himself. You know, a, a sheep is an object of property. It is not a wild animal. And frequently, it is bought with a great price. It is well to know, as certainly as David knew, that we belong to the Lord. Overwhelmingly, the, the idea behind God's role as a shepherd is a loving care and concern. And David found comfort and security in the thought that God cared for him like a shepherd cares for his sheep. David felt that he needed a shepherd. The heart of this psalm doesn't connect with the self-sufficient, but with those who sense their need. The poor in spirit that Jesus described on the Sermon on the Mount find great comfort in the idea that God can be a shepherd to them in a personal sense. Uh, theologian and, and pastor Charles Spurgeon said, that before a man can truly say, the Lord is my shepherd, he must first feel himself to be a sheep by nature. For he cannot know that God is his shepherd unless he feels in himself that he has the nature of the sheep. He must relate to a sheep in its foolishness, its dependency, and in its warped nature of its will. David also says, I shall not want. For David, the fact that God's shepherd-like care was the end uh, of a dissatisfied need. He, he said, I shall not want, both as a declaration and as a decision. I shall not want means that all of my supplies, uh, all of my needs are supplied by the Lord. You know, the Lord is my shepherd. He will take care of me. It's not what I want. That's not what it means. It means I decide to not desire more than, than for what the Lord, my shepherd, gives. Now, I know some of you out there uh, have a story to share about how the Lord as your shepherd provides for you. I, I just wonder, can you go to the chat box and maybe share with everyone else and, 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 and how the Lord has provided for your family. Um, if you have kids, make sure your kids know how the Lord 
has provided for your family? Could, could you ask your kids how the Lord has provided for them? It, you know, it'd be okay to pause the video and to do that right now, if you would like. All right, some of you might be still finishing up, uh, uh, typing in the, in the chat box. You can go ahead and do that uh, while the rest of us go on. The scripture continues to say, He makes me to lie down in the green pasture. He leads me beside the still waters. Think about that. He makes me to lie down. The Lord, as a shepherd, knew how to make David rest when he needed it, just as a literal shepherd would care for his sheep. The implication is that the sheep doesn't always know what it needs and what is best for itself, and, and so it needs the help from the shepherd <clears throat> to lie down in green pastures. The shepherd also knew the good place to make his sheep rest. He faithfully guides the sheep to green pasture. Now, one of the things that I have found out about sheep is that... Um, uh, that sheep do not lie down easily. Uh, they will not unless four conditions are met. And they are, uh, one, because they are timid, they will not lie down if they are afraid. Two, because they are a social animal, they will not lie down if there is friction amongst the sheep. Three, if flies or a parasite uh, troubles them, they will not lie down. And, and finally, fourth, if sheep are anxious about food or hungry, they will not lie down. Now, rest comes because the shepherd has dealt with fear, friction, flies, and famine. <laughs> I, I think, uh, you know, for, for us, the shepherd has everything in control. There is no need for us to be afraid. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Can you picture the green pasture in your mind's eye this morning? I think that the green pasture might be a little bit different than you would expect. I found a, a, a video that I came across recently uh, that I am going to share with you at this time. As part of a shepherd lesson, I did want to look at one thing in the wilderness that will maybe surprise you a bit. Believe it or not, this is called wilderness, midbar, but it's also called green pastures. Now, when you take a Westerner here the first time and you look at this, you find people say, well, I don't know that I can go there because the Psalm 23, the Lord leads me into green pastures has been pictured as belly deep alfalfa. Well, you haven't seen any belly deep alfalfa. And from biblical time to today, it's rare to see a flock in the farm country. There isn't a lot of farm country in this culture. And so farmers kept the shepherds out as much as they could. Maybe they would come in a little bit after the harvest to glean what was left, but you don't want sheep where you can farm. This is the land of the shepherd. Right on the hillside across from us, you can see those grazing trails cut there by sheep maybe as long ago as Abraham's time. They're spaced so that an animal on one path and an animal on another can reach right to the middle between them. That determines the distance, so you can graze an entire hillside. And the shepherds lead their sheep across that hillside slowly, grazing what's there. Now, you look at it from here and you say, what's there? In fact, I remember my first impression. I woke up one morning, I was sleeping out in the wilderness, and I remember waking up, watching a flock of sheep on a hillside like this, and my, my feeling was, what are those rock-eating sheep? I mean, what do they eat? How can you call this green pastures? Well, the answer is, there's a small amount of moisture present here. They get a little bit of rain every year, not much, but a little. 
Second, there is humidity in the air, especially in the evening breeze, like right now, you can feel it. Coming from the west off the Mediterranean, there's moisture in the air. That moisture, combination of the rain and the humidity, condenses or drips along the edge of these rocks here. And if you notice, right around the rocks, almost always next to the rocks, you get little tufts of green. Get one a moment. That's what we refer to as the green pastures. So the shepherd looks for a hillside. That's exactly what she was doing. Look at that flock across from us there, just stunning. Those two shepherd girls have found a hillside that either was exposed to the wind or had that small amount of rain. And they move that flock across the hillside and it's one mouthful here, walk a step or two, another mouthful, another mouthful, another mouthful. Now that changes the green pasture image a little bit, besides the picture changing radically. Green pastures are not everything you need for the rest of your life. If you make that belly deep alfalfa, then what God is saying, if you follow me, I'm gonna plunk you down and you'll never have to move an inch the rest of your life. Just reach out and grab it. Tell me that your life with God has been like that. Worry, said one rabbi, is dealing with tomorrow's problems on today's pasture. In the desert, you learn, the shepherd will get you what you need for right now. Ten minutes from now, you trust the shepherd. Just enough. Wow. <laughs> Have you ever thought about it like that? Uh, was that completely different than what you had pictured in your mind? The scripture continues by saying, he leads me beside the still waters. The, the shepherd knows when the sheep need green pasture, and he knows when the sheep need the still water. The images are rich with a sense of comfort, care, and rest. Uh, not, not comfort like the world thinks of comfort, but a different type of comfort. The Lord knows exactly what we need. And the Lord, as the shepherd leads us, uh, where and where does the shepherd lead and why? Well, he, he restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. <laughs> Think about that for a moment. He restores my soul. The tender care of the shepherd described in the previous verse had its intended effect. David's soul was restored by the figurative green pastures and still waters the shepherd brought to him. Restores may picture the rescue of a lost one. It may picture the strange sheep uh, brought back as in Isaiah 49.5 or, or perhaps in Psalms 60 verse 1 or even Hebrews 60 verse 3, which uses the same verb. Uh, those, the, the sense of often is, is that one who repents or is converted. I don't know about you, but there was a time when I was the lost sheep. And the shepherd came and picked me up and carried me home. What is it that you have lost in your life? Maybe in the chat box below, you can share about a time that you lost something. <laughs> Earlier, just today, as I was preparing to, uh, to prepare this message and bring it to you, I had lost my uh, headphones at the house and I couldn't find them. And I was searching all over for them and then found them you know, as sure as they were right where I left them. In Hebrews, in Hebrew, the word restore my soul can, can mean bring me to repentance. He leads me. The shepherd was a guide. The sheep didn't need to know where the green pasture or the still waters were. All he needed to know was that there was a shepherd and the shepherd would guide the sheep to what he needed. Many of you are concerned about what's going to happen in the days to come. Now, I know that we are not worried. We are not fearful, but we are concerned. Where, where is it that we will go moving forward? How will the Lord provide for us in the, in the days, in the, the weeks to come? The shepherd will, will guide the sheep to what he needs. 
And then the scripture says that in the pass of righteousness, the, the leadership of the shepherd uh, did not only comfort and restore the sheep, he also guides him into righteousness. God's guidance of David had a moral aspect, and, and he was giving him a, a moral guidance uh, uh, in, in, in a path of righteousness. Now, what we know about David is that David did not always follow the guidance of the Lord. But David, the Bible says, was a man after God's own heart. And I am convinced this morning that you are, a, are, are an individual that, that God is longing to hold close and dear to him because God has a special place in his heart for you. And then finally, the scripture says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me your rod and your staff they comfort me this is the first dark note in this beautiful psalm previously david wrote of green pastures and and still water and paths of righteousness yet when following the lord as shepherd one may still walk through the valley of the shadow of death David used this powerful phrase to speak of some kind of dark, fearful experience. It's an imprecise phase, yet it is poetry that makes perfect sense to us, especially to us as many of us are walking through our own valleys. We love our mountaintop experiences. I was so looking forward to gathering with the church this Sunday. I was so, I am so much looking to the mountaintop experience of meeting together with the church and the Beaverton Activity Center on Easter morning. We may or may not be meeting there. Life cannot be about mountaintop experiences. It's almost saddening to me that I preach this message with, with all the passion that I can muster to an empty sanctuary. It's a valley. It's not a mountaintop, but a valley. A valley suggests being hedged in and surrounded. I don't know how many of you are feeling like that as you are, as you are tucked into your homes, as you're practicing this social distancing, as we try to flatten the curve. It's the valley of the shadow of death face facing what seems to David as the ultimate, uh, as ultimate defeat and evil. It is a valley of the shadow of death, not, not facing the substance, uh, not facing the substance of death itself, but the shadow of death casting its dark, fearful outline across David's path. David recognized that under the shepherd's leading, he may walk through the valley of the shadow of death. This isn't a, a, a destination. This isn't a dwelling place. We are not going to be here forever. I don't believe this virus is not going to wipe out humanity. This is going to be short-lived. They will find a vaccination they will find some sort of cure. They're going to find something that's, that's going to help. But sometimes we begin to wonder, are these the signs of the end? David says, I will fear no evil. Despite every dark association with the idea of the valley of the shadow of death, under the care of the Lord his shepherd, David could uh, absolutely say, I will fear no evil. Even in a fearful place, the, the presence of the shepherd banished the fear of evil. And we might say that the shepherd's presence did not eliminate the presence of evil, but it will certainly eliminate the fear of evil. Why? For you are with me. <laughs> this emphasis is that the presence of the shepherd that eliminated the fear and the, 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 the evil for his sheep. No matter his present environment, 
David could look to the fact that God's shepherd-like presence was there with him and know that you are with me and I will fear no evil. Let's have a closing prayer. If you have a prayer request, I would encourage you to uh, either uh, respond on the prayer Facebook page, and uh, there will certainly uh, be people praying for you. Um, if you would like to, you can place your uh, prayer request in the chat box below uh, here on YouTube, and, and uh, people 
but we'll be praying for you there as well. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, fear is a liar. <laughs> uh, we just can't say it any other way. Uh, God, you, you care for us and, and you will take care of us. And, and so, Lord, we are here today and worshiping with our church family. Lord, we can't all be in, in one place as we are uh, used to being. Uh, but, Lord, you are with us. Lord, you are in each and every home. Lord, we know that your word is going out. Lord, we know that you are the good shepherd who takes care of his sheep. And Lord, you will protect us, and we are covered by your blood. Just like to pause here for just a moment and to say if there's anybody out there today that has not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if he is not your guiding shepherd today, that this would be the day that you would confess and repent of your sins and follow him. We never know how much time we have left on this earth. I don't say that to scare you. I just say that to say that every day is a good day to give your heart to the Lord. If you would, just simply confess your sins to the Lord. He already knows about them. He's just waiting for you to be honest with yourself and with him. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive you of your sins and purify you from all un righteousness. I've been starting some new Bible studies, online Bible studies for new believers. If you would like to be a part of one of these Bible studies as a new believer, if you would send me a message uh, to let me know, I would be happy uh, to begin doing those Bible studies with you or, or having somebody else uh, do those Bible studies with you. I want to thank you for uh, being here today. God bless each and every one, and this will conclude our service today. God bless.